<laughs> so, so we're just really waiting for um, uh, Kathy Zakin to join yeah. us, who was who was with the uh, overview last year with you. She should be joining us shortly. Yep. Um, yep. <clears throat> I don't know how many students signed up for this, but I do know that they uh, did forward me some questions to ask. So I do have it kind of organized so we can get some really good insight and feedback from you and, and Kathy as soon as so she we got a, We've got a good crowd. I like mm -hmm. that. Hey, yep. guys. OK. We'll talk soon. Uh, this is good. Yes. And I don't know if they, they don't, may not want to show their faces, but that's OK. <laughs> That's okay. You know, it's like, I, I heard a phrase called Zoom shame, you know, come on. Oh, really? That's, that's the first I'm hearing. So, okay. Okay. But, you know, it's okay. I mean, yeah. All right. I can't well, we'll see. Oh, there's a, a little doggy there. Oh, two dogs. That's cute. <laughs> got okay. Dog. okay. No, they're all hopping on now. This is great. I'm yeah. just looking for, uh, for Kathy. See where Kathy is. Okay. <laughs> see, I haven't seen her yet on this thing. So now, are you you're going into the office, correct? You're not working remote. You're in the office every yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. I never okay. never left. I, I worked right. six days a week from the start of the pandemic through like July, and then uh, started to take a break because we were like this close to running out of um, opiates and um, away. Opiates. Wow. Well, sure. Go ahead. <clears throat> no, no, that's okay. I'll okay. I'll, I'll call her later. Um, the. Uh, this close to running out of like opiate, like fentanyl. We use fentanyl to, um, to, uh, well, to uh, intubate, probably, intubate. right? We yeah, like, right. Uh huh. We were using combinations wow. of, uh, of, uh, you know, really drugs that are used off label for pain management and sedation, I mean, and, and right, and, right. Because we just, and we ran out of inhalers, and, you know, when we were finding out there was some pro coagulant activities going on, pro thrombotic. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Then uh, uh, we got a Pixaban use went from like 20 patients to like 400 in, in one day. <laughs> this zoomed up. Everybody was put on a Pixaban. It was wow. Really other, well. other than medications, how did you uh, kind of weather through your PPE? Oh, well, yeah, yeah. Um, well, we'd wear them three or four days in a row. I mean, you know. Wow. We didn't have the problem that some of the hospitals did with plastic bags and all that stuff. We had we had enough supply, but you had to really negotiate with uh, the the uh, um, companies. I mean, yeah, man. yeah. Awesome. We had a, a local hospital by the school uh, because everybody bugged out. We had quite a bit of PPE in our. Um, it's we have like a sterile compounding simulation lab, so we helped them oh, out as best we could. So yeah. we were like, oh my gosh, it was like unbelievable the phone calls we were getting. Yeah. So. Yeah. So hi, Kathy. Thanks for joining. Hello. Hi. How are you? Barbara. Hi, Mark. How are you? Okay. How are you? Good. So, thank you. I waited for you, Kathy, before I started the general introductions here. So this is great. I don't know exactly how many students are going to join us, but, you You're know, just to be proud. sensitive to the time and the number of questions that they submitted ahead of time, okay. I figured, you know, we'll, we'll start on time and see how it goes. Okay? okay. So the way I have it set up, pretty much like we did last year, is I'll have you both each introduce yourselves, give a little bit about your background and your role and your engagement with you know, pharmacy residents at your respective sites. And then when I start to ask some questions, what I've done is I've kind of grouped a couple of questions together so that I don't have to keep asking you know, back and forth, back and forth. And this way you could collectively present your thoughts and, and we can take it from there. Okay. okay, and for the students who have joined us, um, I'll be monitoring the chat room. So if you do have any questions at the end of all the questions that I ask, you know, feel free to, to you know, type it in the chat room. Very, very involved in the organization. Okay, uh, somebody needs to put themselves on mute. Um, does it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Audrey, I think you need to put yourself on mute. Okay. All right. So, um, Kathy, I'll go with you first, if you'd like to uh, just introduce yourself to the students, okay? Sure, sure. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Kathy Zakin, and I am a professor of pharmacy practice at Massachusetts College of Pharmacy Personal and Health Sciences. Looks like Monty, please put yourself on mute. And, you know, kind of practice. I think Marcy, Barbara, you can mute everybody. Oh, yep. Yeah, okay. All right, there we go. Okay. 
Okay, I guess I'll start over. Um, so my name is Kathy Zakin, and I am a professor of pharmacy practice at Massachusetts College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences in Boston, Mass. Um, I graduated from Northeastern University in 2001. And after that, I went on to do a community pharmacy residency at Walgreens. Um, upon completion of my residency, you know, I had always had an interest in teaching. Um, so I got a job at Mass College of Pharmacy and my practice site, you know, was supposed to be in community pharmacy, but it actually ended up falling through and they asked me if I wanted to do ambulatory care. And I said, sure, I think it's somewhat similar. I guess I'll figure it out. And um, I've been in ambulatory care ever since. My practice site is at Atrius Health. And I do have a clinic where we do collaborative drug therapy management for patients who have diabetes, high cholesterol, and, and high blood pressure. And I'm the director of the PGY1 residency for Mass College of Pharmacy and Atrius Health, which is an ambulatory care and managed care residency program. Okay, thank you very much, Kathy. Mark? You can hear me, right? Yes. Nick, I wasn't muted, all right. And, <laughs> and, and, and I'll tell you, that's the kind of job that you want, what you want to aspire to and why we're here to talk about residency. That is a cool job to have in terms of ambulatory care. It's really what, what it's all about. I, maybe I can comment about um, where I think pharmacy is going, but I'm Mark Sennett. Um, I am the clinical pharmacy director um, at Montefiore, which is across the river. I also, uh, and it's great to have everybody here incidentally. Welcome, thank you. Um, uh, I also uh, manage our system-wide pharmacy and therapeutics committee. Um, I was a residency director for 20 some years and I, I took a role on to manage our formulary in a way that really reflects where pharmacy needs to go and looking at outpatient outcomes rather than efficacy. The FDA takes care of efficacy. What a pharmacy needs to do is really ask the question, does a drug even work in a real setting? So uh, that's what we're trying to start. Do that's what we're going to start doing at Montefiore. Uh, so my role was RPD. I take residence in uh, uh, practice management, uh, but I also coordinate a, about 25 preceptors and anything for what, what Kathy was talking about in ambulatory care, but a lot of inpatient. My, my thing is inpatient. So we've got outpatient ambulatory care and inpatient here. Uh, so I have clinical specialists that work in in critical care, infectious disease, pediatrics, oncology, perioperative services, uh, cardiology, the NICU, uh, ambulatory care as well, um, a lot of different areas. So you can see the opportunities just get you, gets you really kind of excited about what there is to do. Um, I also work nationally with the American Society of Health System Pharmacists. Um, I was, um, I'm an active surveyor. Um, I surveyed a residency program in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and I, you would th I, I took that, that trip because I thought I'd be able to go there, but mm -hmm. I ended up doing it here in my basement because ah, of the pandemic. That was a bummer. But next, next year, they're going to go um, on site again. So I've been doing that for a while. And I also was on the commission that actually sets the standards for residency accreditation. So uh, you come to the right place if you want to get some expert, expert stuff I mean, for Kathy. <laughs> Not really me, but... Uh, and, uh, <laughs> Feel free to ask as many questions as you want, but I know that Barbara has some questions all lined up, but uh, thanks right. again for coming. Okay, thank you, Mark. So, so students, as you can see, I don't think you can get uh, a better duo of consummate professionals here to answer questions about residency. So you should leave this session uh, pretty knowledgeable in what you need to do to prepare yourself. So um, I have the first set of questions um, I guess I have about three questions I'll just group together. So Kathy, you know, there'll be for both of you will answer the same questions, but I'll go with you first, Kathy. So what are the overall characteristics you look for in an ideal residency candidate? And then how do students make themselves stand out, okay, amongst the competition? And then what do you look for in their cover letter that makes them appealing to you as one of the interviewers for potential residencies. Okay, so those kind of three questions, you could weave your answers all together, but I'll go with you first, Kathy, okay? Perfect, if I forget anything, just let me know. Yeah, I will, I will. <laughs> um, so I think first and foremost, you know, over the years, residencies have become much more um, competitive. You know, when I was in pharmacy school, it was residencies were kind of just starting to come about, um, well, I shouldn't say, it. they've been around for a long time, but they weren't as competitive. Now they're very competitive and it seems as though everybody's telling all the students, you need to do residency, you need to do residency. Um, 
Some students do not want to do residency. They're tired after six years of pharmacy school. They're burnt out. Um, others, you know, have bills to pay. They financially can't afford to do a residency. Um, and others want to do one, but they're not quite sure where to start. So I think, you know, if you are truly interested in doing a residency, you know you want to specialize in infectious disease or oncology or ambulatory care, or you want to teach at a college of pharmacy, you know, um, probably I'd say when you're in your third or fourth year, maybe hook up with a professor or a mentor at school and maybe work on some research or, you know, present a few posters at mid-year, anything community service, you know, um, brown bag events, um, talking to senior centers, you know, just taking blood pressures at a senior center, anything that's going to kind of make you stand out on your CV because, you know, all pharmacy students, they all do rotations, you know, they, most of them work. If you do not work and you're able to work, you know, a lot of international students I know are, are unable to work, but if you can work, um, you know, that's great. You know, the more experience, the better. Some work community pharmacy their entire career and um, at pharmacy school, others stick with the hospital. Sometimes they bounce back and forth, but that gives them a little bit of an added benefit. In terms of your cover letter, you know, what I look for is why do you want to apply to my residency? You know, I, I know you want to do a residency, but why do you want to come to MCP Atrius Health? What can you offer me? What do I have that you're interested in? You know, I get so many generic letters, which I know that they've sent them out to 25 other programs, which that's okay, but you know, that I don't, I'm not going to interview you. You know, I've had people email me that say they want to do pediatrics. Well, I don't do anything with pediatrics. So, you know, um, and again, when you're writing your cover letter, make sure that you are addressing it to the correct person. You know, if you're sending it to me, don't say, don't say dear Dr. Senate. Um, you know, if you're sending it to Mark, you know, make sure you're addressing it to him. And, and again, that's having somebody it. else look it over because you know right. you, you get tired after looking at the same thing um you know and, and explaining why why do you want to do a residency what are your plans for the future what what have you done in pharmacy school that's geared you to um get you ready to do this uh you know and and so forth things of that sort and i think um for me when i'm interviewing candidates you know are you motivated you know it's it's another year and it's a it's a a fast year, but it could be a very long year if you don't have the heart to do it. You know, um, don't do a residency just because your friends are doing it, your parents are telling you to do it, you know, ASHP is telling you to do it. Do it because you want to do it. Uh, if you put in the time and the effort, you're going to have a great year. You're going to learn a ton. Uh, but if you don't and you're just doing it to do it, you're, you're going to be miserable. So somebody who's motivated, really good time management skills because, you know, you're really busy. You have your longitudinal residency project, you have a thousand other projects going on, you know, you have to staff, um, maybe you serve on a PT committee, you know, during your residency. So good calendar, good time management, you know, and just, just, a, I think a good positive attitude, I think would be good. Hey, thank you, Kathy. Mark? That, <laughs> Kathy said a lot of what, um, and I'll just repeat a little bit differently. Um, no, 20 ASHP, and again, that's American Society of Health System Pharmacists, which is the, um, it's an organization if you don't know with about, I think it's about 40,000 members. It's, it's a fairly large organization, but, and they put together something called the 2030 Practice Advancement Initiative. And there were three major goals that they come out here, what, what they see pharmacy in the future. Uh, for me, one of them, and one is uh, pharmacogenomics. Uh, and um, that's a, a, a real big area uh, that's going on. Uh, the other two, though, I think are really based on why you want to do a residency. Um, one would be uh, direct patient care that we're really trans, we're, we're changing the model here from, from concentrating on the product to concentrating on the patient. You know, I always look at dispensing like breathing. Most of the time, we're not thinking about breathing. So if you have good systems behind you that are dispensing drugs, you don't have to really think about them. It's not a problem. And then when you get, you know, you start running or something, you're breathing heavy, well, maybe that's that's when you got to fix the dispensing part. So because of automation, because of um, um, artificial intelligence, that kind of stuff's going, uh, it's not as important anymore. You know, I, I'm a little older and I remember that when we made everything, but now we don't make we don't make a lot of stuff. So do you want really if you're really a people person and you can't wait to talk to a patient, that's something. Particularly where Kathy works, you really want to have that that love, that passion. I call it that. You have to have that passion to go in and take care of patients. The other thing is my passion is data driven care. 
It's all about the data. And what better profession than pharmacy? Because you really learn how to really pick apart a research protocol, pick apart a, uh, a manuscript and say, that quite, that's, that's the manuscript paper. It really doesn't answer the question of whether or not this drug's any better than what we already have. So that's your one of your specialties that's going to make you stand out from a, a, a nurse or, or a physician. Um, so you got to really, so and on what Catherine was saying, you got to have that passion. You really want to go in there. We know when you're interviewing that you're doing it because eh, I might as well try it or everybody else is doing it. Or I'm not really sure what to do. <laughs> or, well, that's actually okay. If you don't really know what you, what you want to do with your life, come to a residency. But you got to be passionate about, you really know you want to do direct patient care or you want to do uh, data-driven care. So what do we look at? We look at, that as what Kathy said, just enthusiasm. I look at, they always people ask me, what do you look for? Enthusiasm. Because you know what? When you get into a residency, the word in residency is reside. You're going to be living in your residency. You better love it. Because we don't love it. Oh boy, it's going to be a rough year. So uh, uh, really have that enthusiasm. Um, now your, your letter of intent or your cover letter, you know what a lot of them sound like to us? And I think I can speak for Kathy on this. Blah, 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 blah. Because we got about 100 of them, 120 of these letters. And so you kind of really be unique. Create a story, a story about yourself. And uh, then, you know, if we can't put it down, then you know what? You, you got, that, that thing goes on. Your, 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 your application goes on top of the pile. So... Um, that, that, I think the letter of intent really will display what your passion is, what your love is. Why, why are you doing this? And where do you, where do you, where do you want to go? Where do you want to go with this thing when you're done? I want to get a job. Well, that's kind of understood. But I, I want to do a job that, that, that affects care, that makes people, um, that uh, in, improves their life or, or whatever else you want to talk But come from the heart because then it becomes very real. Um, and uh, the other thing too is, I just want to say, I, I was gonna, I wrote, was writing it down, Kathy, when you said that I've gotten letters addressed to somebody else, and I'm looking at this. This is from for NYU. This is it for me. I just go to the next applicant. If there wasn't enough effort to make it personal to Montefiore, so here's a little trick: if you write stuff in a cover letter that I know, therefore you went to our you went to our website and you know all about Montefiore. You have an interest in Montefiore. But if you're just taking, talking about something generic, I want to help people. Well, of course you do. You're, that's why you went to pharmacy school. But I want to do specific things. And it can't emphasize enough with Kathy you said. I want to be in pediatrics. Well, we don't have pediatrics. So why did you even apply to my program? But I really like your infectious disease program. It was made a center of excellence with uh, IDSA. And I really want, that's because I want to come to your, I, your, your program and learn more about infectious disease. Or I like the variety of your rotations, including, then I think it would be good. So personalize that letter of intent. Uh, but I think, again, I'm going to go back, enthusiasm and just passion. What's your passion? That's what I'm going to ask you. What's your passion? Thank you, Mark. I mean, the, the points are just so spot on. And I think, you know, what you had mentioned, even if students are interested in fellowships, we tell them the same thing. Research the organization that you are looking to apply right. to. And right. so many times I've had students even interview at the school for different fellowships we've had. And I'll say, well, tell me a little bit about the company. And there's like, you know, crickets. They haven't <laughs> done their research. And to me, that is such an easy thing to do with all yeah. the social media, you know, access that we have. So research the company or the institution that you're going to apply to. I think that's key. So thanks for mentioning that, Mark. So uh, another set of questions I have here. Uh, somebody had wanted me to ask if having a FOND degree and a dual master's degree has any, you know, edge in a residency program because we do have dual degree master's degrees so some students may be coming with maybe an mba or a clinical research master's mm -hmm. or master's in health science mm -hmm. so kathy i'll go to you and if you could just let me know if that's a differentiator for some students or how you would look upon that um i think you know i think that it would depend on the type of residency you know for me it 
probably wouldn't be that big of a, a, a deal breaker if you didn't have one because I'm strictly ambulatory care. You know, maybe for Mark, it's different because he has so many more different programs. I think if you're looking for a program that maybe has some sort of a business side or you want to go into some sort of um, pharmacy administration, you know, um, it, it, yeah, I mean, you're thinking maybe like a fellowship that has some sort of, you know, business into it. But if you're going to look for strictly patient care, I, it's probably not something that's, that's, I mean, it doesn't hurt to have. Um, but, you know, I think it's, if you're thinking about maybe doing something on the business side late, later on, um, you know, we, we do have a pharmacy administration rotation for my residency program, um, but it's not, we don't focus on administration the whole time. So for me, it wouldn't be a deal breaker, but again, I think it depends on the type of program, but maybe Mark will have a little bit more information for that. Thank you, Kathy. Mark, what are your if, thoughts? If somebody had a master's in public health, for example, this is what I'd be doing. Yeah, because you know what? Um, we, we're looking at outcomes-based um, formulary management and what a great population health in the Bronx. I mean, I, I would that would be something that I would um, could teach you a lot more and really utilize that master's in public health. Uh, an MBA, the same, but not necessarily as much because that's really more of a management thing. And as Kathy said, we have ma practice management, but it's it's one or two months maybe, and that's it. But however, you can learn how to manage a pharmacy too. So there, there is an advantage to that. I, I will go to that a lot of uh, residencies are required to have projects. Now our projects, our outcomes research projects. So you've been, you really get a step ahead there. you will be able to know the concepts behind uh, performance improvement initiatives and, and, and outcomes and, and uh, statistics. Uh, anybody here like uh, kind of ignore your statistics class? <laughs> well, it comes back full, full circle when you do a residency and when you get a job. So hopefully you learn your, your statistics, but I, I would love to have, I like to see that. That does give me a little, give you a little edge. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Mark. So now another few questions I can try to group together. So actually preparing for the residency interview, uh, some students had asked, how do they prepare for any case-based questions if they come up during the interview? And then we also have a mini residency longitudinal appy that some students are able to take advantage of. So how, if for the students who were able to complete those appies, how could they weave that into uh, a residency interview question and show that they, while they, you know, they've had little snippets of a residency program and kind of know what they're walking into. So how can they answer a question or how would you, you know, just give them some tips on weaving into case-based questions and how could they mention that they've done a longitudinal mini residency? So Kathy, I'll go to you. Um, you know, I think, you know, when you go on your, your interview, first of all, prepare, you know, again, do the research, know the program, know, check out the preceptors, you know, you're going to get an itinerary before. So maybe go on LinkedIn, look at your preceptors, see what their specialties are. Um, you know, I don't, you know, you can't anticipate if they're going to ask you a case-based question. And if they do, you have no idea what, what kind of question they're going to ask. So you answer to the best of your ability. And if you truly do not know, just say, you know what? That's not something that I'm 100% I'm familiar with. I'm gonna look into it and I'm gonna get back to you after the interview. And then I would go home, I would look into it, I would research it and I would send, you know, whoever asked you the question along with the director, your response. You know, those residencies or those rotations, those little mini um, residency appy rotations, you know, when you're introducing yourself, let them know, say, you know, something I did that was a little unique to me was I did this, residency, um, this API residency, and this is what we did during it. And this is what I've learned from it, you know, and, and this is how I can help, you know, maybe bring this to this residency program if I'm precepting students here. Um, so I think, I think that's kind of the route I would take if I was the student, um, you know, again, you, it's like taking the boards, right? You, you don't know what you're going to get asked. You just hope that you know the answer um, or at least the general sense of the answer. And again, if you don't, it's okay, but don't make something up because they're gonna know that you're making something up. And then that looks a thousand times worse. I, I would, you know, I tell my students all the time, if you don't know, just say, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not hundred percent sure, um, you know, let me look into it and I'll get back to you. And then be if, even if you were working in a pharmacy, you know, and a patient asks you a question, you don't wanna make up an answer. Uh, so you look into it. Thank you, Kathy. Mark, hear your thoughts? Um, 
Yeah, I'm a, I have a little bit different spin here. Um, first of all, I don't ever expect anybody to know everything. I mean, for goodness sakes, I mean, <laughs> there's too much in pharmacy to know everything. Um, so don't worry about it. What we actually look for is how you think, think the process through. So um, it would be more about, so you, let's say it's a di diabetes and you, you forget, I don't know, you forget uh, uh, the dose of insulin. No, I, I, you can look things up on the, these things, you know, these phones, you, you look stuff up, uh, but how you actually, how you're actually going to incorporate and how you're going to use that medication is really the key. You don't have to remember the details, just the process. So we want to, the reason why we use cases is we want to see how you're thinking through the process. Okay. Uh, well, I'll give you some advice. If you're going to do a case, remember a few things. Remember the drug therapies, like you need to put them on blank, blank, and monitoring for outcome. Because a, a pharmacy in the past should be, used to be dispense the meds, see you later, hope, hope it works, hope it works. No, no. And even nowadays, it's you give a, a, you recommend a certain antibiotic therapy. Then you look and see, did the fever go down? Are they feeling better? Did the cultures come back? Uh, and how do they come back? So you look for that outcome. Is, I mean, that's my theme, guys. And she got the hint. But also, so what therapy, what outcome, what side effects you want to manage too. If you have those three things in there, I think you're going to do okay with the case. If you're off by here and there, that's okay. I mean, really, there's some basic stuff stuff we have to know. I mean, if someone, if you recommend uh, for a patient with pseudomonas uh, cefazil, and then you know, we might have an issue here. But if you're really, if you're kind of far off on, I mean, you're, you're in the general category, I'm, I'm okay with it. That's fine. Um, as far as a, like a, 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 a appy to prepare you for a residency, one thing I it would have to depend on what that is because residencies are based on something like over a hundred objectives. Okay, so in terms of like there's the uh, outcome R two, which is patient care. So we evaluate evaluate how you get along with patients, how you get along with the team, how you collect data, analyze data, create a plan, and follow for outcome. Okay. Uh, and then documentation. So if you were doing something like that and you started talking residency buzzwords, <laughs> I would be like, oh, this person knows a residency program. Or you know the concepts of modeling, coaching, facilitating. So um, um, things like that. So if you, if you know a little bit about how residency works and what the goals are of a residency, that's actually pretty darn good. Okay, so. Okay, thank you, Mark. Mark, you had said something and it just prompted me to ask another question. You know, some of the students um, that do these mini residencies have the opportunity because of when they're done. They're done probably prior to ASHP, you know, when we used to have the on site mid years. Now everything has been remote for the past two years. Right. But if these students have had the opportunity to present posters during right. the poster session, that right you know, represent what they worked on with some outcomes, et cetera. Um, I would say that would be a wonderful thing to weave into the course Absolutely. of conversation. Yes. Yeah. So what are your or, thoughts? Or we're going to ask you about your poster. So if you're a third author and don't know anything about the poster, maybe you ought to reconsider putting it on your, your, your CV, because I'll ask you, so what, what outcomes... So what results did you get? What were some confounding variables on that study you did with vancomycin and, and MRSA patients? And you're like, oh, uh, <laughs> no. So know a little bit of, know everything in your CV because we might ask you about it. It's, okay. Because sometimes it's really thrilling. Remember to put in your CV the th things that you love to do too, just as an aside. I, and there was somebody that was from University of Michigan who founded a string quartet. And I thought that was the coolest thing. So we'd spend a lot of time talking about music. And then you get to, I get to know the really, you know, your person, but remember it's work-life balance. So <laughs> make sure to put in your CV, the things you love to do. I love to cook. I love running. I love the New York Jets. You, you really give, you make me feel good if you're a Jet <laughs> fan, but, <laughs> but uh, things like that. And then you, we look for well-roundedness. Okay, thanks Mark. Kathy, you have anything to add to that question about the posters or not really? No, I mean, I, I agree. You know, I, I was just thinking back when I was in pharmacy school, um, we had to take a pharmacoeconomics course. And part of that course was we had to go to mid-year and present a poster. And so we put that on our CV and every single residency interview I went on, I was asked about that poster. 
every single one. What did, what was the poster, you know, what was the class about? What was your project about? What was your role? What was the outcome? Um, so Mark is 100% right. We will ask. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Good, good examples. This, this is good stuff. Um, so I have um, inevitably at the end of the interview, I'm sure you folks always leave a little bit of time for like that one final question where you may say to the candidate, is there anything you would like to ask me? Yes? No? Okay. So is there one particular question that you feel when a candidate asks you that they really have it together, that they're, you know, they come through as passionate, they understood the whole process, and that this would be based on the question, a candidate that you would like to interview at another level. Mm -hmm. So if that this candidate has like a final question, what would you suggest a good final question be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, think about that because there's a lot of good fun questions. Mark, I'm going to let you go first because I'm going <laughs> to think about it. Well, I'll go back to what I mentioned before. If you know something about the program, describe to me your uh, some um, research that you've done at Montefiore or uh, what's your what's your vision for your department and what what do you what do you what's your idea of what pharmacy is or or a vision like that. Um, uh, something, something related to, for me, it would be the patient advance, our practice advancement initiative for 2030. You know, I'm really driven towards the future. So, uh, and hopefully you guys are too, because that's why you want to do a residency. Mm -hmm. So what do you, where do you guys see yourself in five years in your department? You're going to get a kind of a picture about how progressive the department is. So that that's, I, I love it when people get if you can find something out about the RPD, because you're gonna be talking about the RPD and ask them something that, that, that they're interested in or what they do. I noticed a, a, some research that you did on blank blank. I'd be like, oh, this person's done their homework. <laughs> cool. And then I, I, get, I would be pretty impressed. You spent some time on it. Yeah, I get a lot of um, residency candidates ask me, what, what program changes do you see that you would like to make based on feedback from previous residents or your current resident? Is there anything you're going to change for the upcoming year? Uh, and then, you know, if I make some suggestions and then I'll ask them, well, what suggestions do you have? Any recommendations based on what uh, you talked to today and who you talked to? What, what thoughts do you have? So that way it kind of stimulates a conversation back and forth again. So that shows that they were actually listening and paying attention to oh, yeah. the different different rotations that they're going to be going on. Yeah, that's a great point, Kathy. So <clears throat> I always get a little uh, puzzled when I ask this question, but somebody asked it. So, do you suggest applying for the same type of residency at various institutions, or different types of residencies at the same institution if they have different ones or both? What, what are your suggestions about the process in applying? Because there's so many different types of residencies. If a student is kind of torn, do I want an ambulatory care versus something else? Do I apply for both kinds? And how, how would you approach that? Uh, yeah, okay, I, I, I wouldn't do that. Personally, I would, I would apply to a, a one type of residency. Pharmacy is a really small world. And if I find out that you're just kind of fishing for something, you're just trying to get into any residency, what kind of interests do you really have in mind? Are you just more interested in doing a residency or doing a residency at Montefiore? So I, I wouldn't do that. But that's particularly relevant for if you're going for a PGY2 and you apply for one in AMP care, one in critical care, one in tra I mean, those are completely different re types of residency. So what, what's your, pa my thing is maybe you don't have a passion because if you go to Kathy's ambulatory care residency, you don't really have a passion in ambulatory care. Eh, do I want to have you there? I don't know. Good, good point, Mark. And I, I liked what you emphasized in that pharmacy is a small world. So I'll get to some questions down the road about that, that comment. So Kathy, yeah. did, did you want to add anything to what Mark said? Yeah, I, you know, I, I agree. You know, I think if you want to do inpatient, that's a lot different than if you want to do ambulatory care. It's not really, they're not really the same. You know, I mean, I, I knew I don't want to do anything inpatient. I'm not an inpatient kind of person. Um, I like to talk to patients. I like to see them, you know, back in clinic for follow-up and things of that sort. So, you know, again, unfortunately, when I was graduating, there weren't, wasn't that much ambulatory care. I don't even think there was any in my, you know, I, I was kind of limited to the Northeast. 
Um, so the, luckily there's a community pharmacy, but I, I, you know, I do get candidates who say, you know, I've interviewed for community pharmacy, I've interviewed for inpatient, I'm not really sure what I want. And, you know, I understand, it's understandable, but if I have somebody to come that says, oh, well, you know, I interviewed at Beth Israel because they have a great oncology program. I'm thinking to myself, well, why did you interview with me? Because, you know, we don't, we don't do anything with oncology. Um, so again, I think trying to narrow it down as much as you can. And again, you know, when it is back in person, it's expensive. You know, you're flying all over, you're staying in different hotels and you need to be prepared. So, you know, narrow it down to what your, what your interest is. And, and I think it'll be easier for you as well. I, I give a, a, just a spin on that though. If you're not really sure what you want to do, that's okay. Because yeah, yeah it's, it can go either way. But if you're not sure what you want to do, then go to a large program like mine. We've got like 15 rotations. And then we'll make a, in a residency, you make a plan in the beginning. I always ask the resident, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? Let's make a plan then. And then we'll ask in three months. You still want to do that? You still want to do that? You go to Kathy's, you really should have a kind of an idea. I don't really want to do that inpatient stuff, but I really want to do inventory mm -hmm. care. Right. Or managed care PGY1s. Same thing. You want to do outcomes, outcomes based type of research. You want to work with managed care companies. That's very different than am ambulatory care and very different from inpa inpatient type of work. So it's like that. It's like, do you want to be a scientist? Do you want to be an artist when, 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 you're, when you're going in high school and, and looking for college? It's the same type of thing. You want AmCare, Managed Care, Fellowship, or a PGY1. They're all completely different, okay? But inpatient, there's tons of opportunities. So if you say, I don't really know what to do, I'm like, yeah, that's great, because I don't want you to be coming in well, when I was five years old, I saw my mother doing something. I said, oh, so you're making a career choice based on something you saw when you were five? I mean, no, 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 no. Let's, let's, let's do something different. At least try to do something different. If you love it, you love it. But there's a lot out there. It's so exciting. So, Mark, based on, um, this is kind of a good segue question, I think, based on all the opportunities that you mentioned are out there, Eric, suppose a student is not successful in securing a residency. How, um, I guess, challenging is it to secure a clinical pharmacy position within an institution without that residency? And I guess the current, I'll say, you know, trending, say, two to four years out based on the fact these students are going to mm -hmm. be graduating shortly. Mm -hmm. So that's my question. I'll tell you, it depends on the hospital you go to. You go to our, my hospital, if you want to be a clinical specialist, you need two years of residency. Okay. If you want to do, if you want to, if you want to be a, um, what we call like a hybrid or a decentralized pharmacist, decentralized pharmacist better, where you're doing some uh, order verification and direct patient care, we try to get people with a PGY1 residency. So, um, but it's not impossible to, um, um, if you haven't matched, not to not be able to get a clinical position, but you need to show that drive and that enthusiasm. So if you're interviewing for a job, you can say, is there any opportunity to do some decentralized work? And then, oh, okay. Now remember guys, if you don't, if you first you don't succeed, so what? Try it again, all right? <laughs> I actually love it when somebody tries it again, tries to apply to a residency again. And then meanwhile, they've been, work, they've been working with a professional organization. They did some lectures. They, uh, you know, they uh, maybe called me and inquired about, hey, how's it going over there? I'm still interested in your program. Then I know this person's really passionate. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Kathy, any, any other thoughts? Yeah, you know, if you, you know, a lot of students, if they don't get a residency, you know, they're, they're devastated. They're like, now what, what am I going to do? You know, I didn't apply for a job. All the jobs at CVS and Walgreens are taken. Um, you know, so find a job where you can go and do something. And if it is CVS, talk to the pharmacy manager, say, can I hold a blood pressure clinic? Can I yes. have a diabetes day where people bring in their blood sugar readings? And, yes. you know, I can, I can, you know, do some medication therapy management. And so if you were to apply again next year, you could say, you know what, listen, unfortunately I didn't match last year, but I, I really am so dedicated to a residency. I worked at Walgreens, but I held blood pressure days. I held diabetes days. I held, you know, fitness days, um, you know, just to kind of, so that way you're sort of keeping your hand in it and, and so forth. 
Um, you know, a lot of times students, if they don't get a residency, they say, you know what, maybe it wasn't meant to be. And they go and they start at a, at a hospital and they work as a staff pharmacist and they work their way up. You know, a lot of times they work their way up to a director of pharmacy mm -hmm. um, and they work really hard. Like Mark said, you, you just put in the time and you just, you know, work your way up, you know, or you're in community pharmacy and you become the district manager. Um, some will go work for a drug company. And again, they start at the bottom as a sales rep and then they work their way up. Um, I but see them in my office. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then we're manager. I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah, so it just takes a little, the road sometimes takes a little bit longer or go back to school and get your master's in public health, get an MBA, um, yep. get a master's in healthcare administration, you know, a little something extra to, you know, give you that boost if you're applying for various jobs. Kathy, it's funny that you said, you know, go back and get another master's, you know, there's so many different types of certifications out there now too. You know, you, you can Google anything online mm -hmm. and there's a certification in a particular area of pharmacy mm -hmm. practice. So how do you folks look upon those? So for some students who may not be graduating out with a dual degree, mm -hmm. uh, are they a differentiator? Are these cert certifications a differentiator for you? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I agree. Go ahead, Mark. Go ahead. No, no, you go. Yeah, I mean, again, it showed that you took that effort to go and learn something additional other than just sitting in your typical classes in pharmacy school. So maybe you went and um, got a certification in asthma, or maybe it was something with diabetes or MTM. You know, they have a lot of opportunities for students to do MP MTM. I think there's now some in, in like clinical psych, you know. Um, so again, it showed that you had that drive to say, you know what, I kind of want to do a little something extra on the side and then you could take that to your interview or and again if you don't get get a residency you do that during the year that you're working anti-coag is so you know so popular so what can you do in anti-coag what more can you learn um, and then maybe you can get a position as an anti-coag pharmacist yeah I, I tell you if I had somebody coming in that didn't match last year and they started a, 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 a you know blood pressure clinic I would just interview them right away. I, I wouldn't even hesitate. I would think, wow, that is the coolest thing. How, what kind of initiative is that? That is just goes far beyond. And, and certificates, I'm glad you brought those up, Barbara, because certificates, uh, I know that UB, for example, has a, uh, in Buffalo has a certificate in, pub, in, um, in um, um, population health and in outcomes and stuff. And that is really great. I mean, to, because you don't have to take a four-year course in there or two years in that. I mean, just if you know the concepts and, and, and the process and you, you involve a little bit of a, a project, that, that's, that would be great. That's great. Because no one has $100,000 hanging around and get a master's at Columbia. Exactly. So, you know. exactly. <laughs> okay. Um, Mark, you had touched a little bit on this um, when we first started, but I just have a general question about what residency areas do you think provide the most opportunities for employment and yeah. future trends? So yeah. I think you mentioned, Mark, a little bit about HEOR, outcomes research, population health, all these personalized medicine. So, I mean, I remember you mentioning them earlier, but if there's anything else you'd like to add now, that was uh, one of the last, next to the last questions. Yeah, I, I'll tell you, I think uh, what Kathy does is, is AMP care is still very big because we're trying to keep people out of the hospital. Well, one way to do it is to give them good care, right? And in New York State, we have, and in, in Massachusetts, we have collaborative agreements. So you can have your own clinics and, and basically manage chronic diseases. And, what, and you can really justify it with your background in science by keeping people out of the hospital. Then, of course, with a little science back, uh, research background, you can measure that value and even be more valuable. Because remember, you're competing against nurse practitioners and PAs. And um, you got to show that, yeah, okay, but I, I got that edge. Another area would be um, um, infectious disease. Every hospital needs to have an, an antibiotic stewardship program. So to have that um, a, a residency and maybe a, a residency in infectious disease, you, 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 you gotta, you, you're almost, almost, almost always likely to get a job. Key is you got to be able to move. Some people are very... For like, like people need to stay in their family or need to stay in a certain area. I totally understand that completely. Family is so important for support. And, uh, you know, it, absolutely. But you remember, you, you can go do a residency and come back, you know, spend one year away and 
you know, and just I've, I've been able to sleep overnight in every state in the United States due to ASHP and my, I love to travel. This country is really wonderful. And, and you know, you can go, go to Utah for a year and then come back. And then you bring back that knowledge and infectious disease and you know what, then, you, then you'll get a job. So I think those two areas are pretty big uh, as far as growth right now. Critical care, there are a lot of residency programs, but almost every hospital has a critical care unit. So that's actually probably a good place to go to. Okay, thanks Mark. Kathy, you have anything else to add? No, I mean, I would just echo what Mark said about if you're able to go and do a residency somewhere other than where you went to pharmacy school, go. You know, it's a year. And if you decide to do another year and you go to a different state, it's two years of your life. Um, you can learn so much from people who aren't in your, you know, your little bubble. Um, you meet new friends, more colleagues. You have these connections, you know, and then if you come back, you always have the opportunity to do research with them. And then, you know, maybe in 10 years, you say, you know, I want to move back to Utah. Um, and now you have that connection. And, you know, um, I just think it's such a great opportunity if you are able to go. And, you know, again, that Boston, it's so competitive. Every, in New York, everybody wants to go, right? They, they want to go. If you go to North Dakota, not everybody wants to go to North Dakota. So you might have a little bit more opportunity and a little bit better of a chance of, you know, getting a residency program. Um, so I, I, if you can, I would, I'd highly, highly recommend going. Absolutely. Yeah, there's great programs out there. I went to Bismarck, good residencies. Uh, Wisconsin has great residencies. Same with Michigan and the South and um, uh, Texas and, and uh, uh, Florida. There's just great residencies everywhere. Um, yeah, you never know. And you might actually stay there. You might yeah. It's kind of nice. And I, and I want to comment on Kathy's comment about uh, the bubble. People stay in New York. I say, why don't you go somewhere else? I mean, my God sakes, the world, this country is just incredibly, you know, people are super nice. And although when you go to the South, you really got to like college sports. I mean, they really get into their football, but eh, you can learn for a year to like Texas and then leave. But, but my, my, my thing is you bring back that, those ideas and energy back from other parts of the country. Um, unfortunately, New York, New Jersey is a little bit, a little bit behind in, in, in advanced practice compared to some of the Midwest hospitals. So you bring that kind of skill set here, back here, and you can you you really transform where, where what hospital you end up working at or what clinic you end up working at. Great, great points. Um, okay, so Kathy, you used the word connections, and I wrote wrote it down. So this is a we always try to tell the students for their entire time that they're with us the value and positive impact that networking has mm -hmm. in your career. Not only when you're in pharmacy school forming, you know, relationships with your peers, et cetera, joining different organizations, et cetera. But I want them to hear it from you because both of you are in the field. And if you could just speak a little bit about for those students who may be a little uncomfortable going outside their comfort zone, you know, if you could emphasize the, what networking does for one's career, okay? Yeah, I mean, you know, when you're in pharmacy school, you know, join the, the student ASHP chapter, the um, APHA student chapter, you know, sometimes I think they have an ACCP student chapter, they have different international um, student pharmacy chapters, join them, but become an active member, you know, maybe become the secretary, the treasurer, the vice president, you know, the president of the organization. And then when you graduate, you know, join you know, um, whatever organization it is that, you know, if you're a critical care, maybe you join a critical care organization, but be active, you know, um, maybe run for like a, a chair elect of a certain, you know, subgroup of that committee that you can, you know, make some impact on. And then that way you're meeting all these other clinical pharmacists, you know, um, for me, you know, I work at a university, so, you know, we're members of AACP. And, you know, when I was only out of, um, gosh, I think it was 2006. So I'd only been out of pharmacy school about five years. Um, one of my mentors who was my old residency director, he said, you know, you should do the academic fellows leadership program through AACP. And I said, oh, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not qualified. I'm too young. And all these people are so accomplished and they know all this, I, you know, I, I have no idea. He's like, no, no, just apply. I'm like, ah, so I applied somehow I got in. I don't know how, but I, uh, anyway, I got accepted. And I can tell you, it was the best year of my life. It was so fun. I met faculty who were, you know, at the associate or uh, full professor level, and I was still an assistant, deans, department chairs, and they are so knowledgeable, and I learned so much from them, and we did a research project, 
Um, and I kept in touch with them and it was just so nice to work with them on committee committees in the future through AACP. And, you know, then when I went up for promotion, you know, I was able to reach out to them to say, you know, I'm going up for promotion. Would you serve as a reference for me? Or would you write me a letter for my dossier to, you know, describe what we did together in the fellowship program? You know, it's <laughs> nice to have those connections. And again, if I wanted to say, I wanted to, you know, move to Iowa, um, you know, I could reach out to one of my connections and say, you know, is there, are there any positions open there? You know, and maybe they could put in a good word for me. So it's definitely, it, it's hard, especially if you're a quiet person, you know, or you're shy, but I think once you get started, you know, and you meet more people, it gets a little bit easier. And, it, and again, as Mark said before, and Barbara, pharmacy is a very, very small world. So just be careful, you know, you don't want to do anything, you know, bad or say anything bad, you know, or, or at conferences, especially as students, you know, really um, be on your best behavior because you could turn around and Mark would be standing there. And then guess what? You apply <laughs> to his residency program and he says, oh, no, 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 I saw you and, you know, I'm not interviewing you, you know, or, you know, or, or whatever it may be, or, you know, you don't want to, you know, bad mouth anybody because, you know, they could say, oh, well, that was my colleague back in 19... 19- you know, 94 or whatever it was. Um, so yeah, definitely get out there and, and connect, network. Great insight, Kathy, thank you. Mark, did you want Yeah, to I, um, I, I forgot, to, we should probably need to bring this up about social media platforms. Yeah. You know, if you got a, you're, you're doing a beer bong or something like that in <laughs> social media, I, I don't know if that's really gonna affect because we do look at social media platforms. So be careful about that stuff. Maybe take it down if, yeah. if they have stuff like that. Look, we all love the party too. I mean, let's face it. But uh, yeah, some stuff is not 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 really kind of goes overboard. Um, you know, I go to these professional meetings and I know it's a lot of students there because uh, um, their professors told them they need to go. And what do I see? I see all the students talking to each other and they sit at the same table and and I go up there and say, work the crowd, guys. <laughs> you already know each other. Go and work the crowd. Say hello to people. I'm so impressed when someone comes up to me and says, uh, you know, um, I'm uh, um, uh, Sheena, I'm Sheena Licata, and I'm from Fairleigh Dickinson University, and I really want to come to your residency program because and I'm like, wow, cool. <laughs> all right, come on down. Let's talk. And all of a sudden, you got an interview. All right. That's called networking. You got to work the crowd. And if you don't work the crowd, you know, you might, you're, you're going to miss out on that opportunity, whether it be meeting a friend, maybe meeting a spouse eventually, or, or, or but meeting a resident, a future residency director or a future employee. Um, and again, if at first you don't succeed, so what? You keep trying. Um, I always like saying it's, you have to learn how to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, my story goes is that I was definitely afraid of parachuting out of an airplane. So what did you think I did? I signed up for parachuting. It was the scariest thing I ever did, but it, I never forgot. It was the coolest thing ever. Same with running. I can't run 5K. I ran a half marathon. I'll never run a marathon. But if you don't try, you'll never know. So uh, work that crowd. And don't sit with your fellow pharmacy student friends. Go and sit with another class, another table. Bring a, bring a partner if you need to. But, but, uh, but then you'll... I'm going to look at you and go, who are you? Where are you from? What do you want to do when your life grows up? Tell me about yourself, you know, that kind of stuff. And you, you start gaining those relationships. Great, great advice. What well, we're kind of nearing 10 to eight. Um, I just have one last question. I'm sure the students want to hear from both of you. How fulfilling do you find your, your current positions where you folks work right now? And as far as your day-to-day -day activities and engaging with residents, um, I'm, I think they would like to hear from you because you're in it. You know, you, you've, residencies are a part of your day-to-day -day work and your world. So I'll just end with that question. How fulfilling are you in your current position? And would you like to go someplace else from where you are now doing something else? Okay, so I don't know, Kathy, <laughs> you wanna go first? Well, Mark, somebody can take it. I'll oh, go I'd first. Like to, go ahead, um, Mark, go ahead. Okay. I, I've been in Montefiore since the Reagan administration. So <laughs> do that math. Okay. Uh, 1988, I came there. I never left because I love where I work. I love the people. I love the mission of Montefiore. We take care of anybody regardless of anything. And I've been able to um, uh, uh, do the things that I think are important for advancing pharmacy. I 
you never want to have a regret. And I don't have a regret one bit for what I've done because you just don't want to have it where you're looking back, go, I wish I did blank. You don't want to say that. So um, I, I've never had to do that because people say, why do you stay there? I said, well, why should I move? I love what I do. Now, some people love moving and getting different experiences and that's great too. But for me, I, I, and I'm so glad I did a residency. It changed everything. It changed everything of how I think of things, how I present, how I can stand in front of a crowd of 500 people now. Because why? My residency program taught me to do that. So, um, and I, 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 I just think it's the best thing. It's the best choice. And I wish the best of everybody of getting a, a residency. And if you don't get one, try again. Because again, if first you don't succeed, yeah, so try it again. Thank you, Mark. I mean, you give credence and it's so refreshing to hear what you said. If you, if you love and you're passionate about what you do, what's, what's the cliche? You never really work a day in your life. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. no you kind of gave uh, credence to, the, to that saying. So Kathy, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I, like I said, when I was in pharmacy school, I, I knew that I wanted to do a teaching. You know, I, I took an elective in pharmacy school where we could be TAs for the OTC program. So I knew that's what I wanted to do, but I also knew I wanted to, you know, again, help, help patients um, because that's, again, I, I'm a people person. So I like to talk to people. Um, so I had to figure out a way how, to, how I can combine both of those. And so Fortunately, like I said, I did the community residency and um, I started MCP in 2002. And, you know, when I started, I, I was like, oh, wow, this is this is great. But I wonder, you know, what, what else am I really supposed to be doing? You know, I got this this clinic or I didn't have a clinic back then, but I have these patients that I see and then I have to do teaching and I have to do service. I have to do scholarships. So it was a little bit overwhelming at first. <laughs> um you know, and I, you know, I was probably two years in. I said, God, am I going to do this the rest of my life? I, you know, I'm not sure. And I like it, but um, so I, at one point I actually did look for another position to be a clinical pharmacy coordinator. Um, and I went and I interviewed and I'm sitting on the interview. And I'm like, I don't want to do this. This is, a, I don't want to do administration all day. I want to be with students. I want to be with patients. Um, you know, I want to be with the residents. And, you know, I actually went and told my department chair, I said, listen, I interviewed for another job. And, um, it's, it's, I, you know, I felt bad not telling her, but I, you know, I told her and she said, you know, there's so many opportunities for you here. And at that point, you know, we, um, I was able to just get involved in a lot of different committees at the school. And then I took over the residency program and kind of like Mark, you know, I, I can't imagine doing something else. You know, I, I, I will probably be here until I retire unless I win the mega millions at some point, but, <laughs> uh, you know, I don't, I don't think that's happening or Powerball, whatever it is, um, you know, yeah. but, you know, I, I, I mean, I like, I like working with students, you know, I like when they, you teach them and a light bulb goes off or when they, when you get an email after they've graduated, say, you know, what, I just want to thank you for, you know, the time you took to, you know, talk to me about residencies or, you know, helping me with a problem in class or, you know, that patient we saw, how are they doing? Um, and again, I love, love seeing patients. I see tons of diabetic patients, you know, and um, just yesterday I had a patient, their A1C went from 10 to 7.1. And she was yeah. so appreciative um, because now she can have her knee surgery. And I said, uh, you know, it just makes you feel good. Like, and the students are like, wow, we, you know, we actually did that. And that makes them, and it shows that, you know, you can, you can make an impact. So yeah, I don't, I don't foresee myself doing anything else either. <laughs> okay. You know, Kathy, you said one thing, and this was the last question um, that I had forgotten actually to ask when I was talking about the interview process. So at the end of the interview process, um, as far as what should the students do once they leave the interview? Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned the word, you know, or somebody sent you a thank you. Yep, so yep. I was just going to say, if you could kind of, you know, speak a little bit about the fact that they should send an email thank you and how you receive those thank yous as mm -hmm. part of the interview committee, if you could just touch base on that a little bit. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, before COVID, um, I would always tell students, you know, send a handwritten note. It goes a long way. A nice mm -hmm. handwritten note, thanking mm -hmm. them for the time and doing it in a timely manner. So, you know, I would do it that weekend. So it gets to them the following week. Um, now, you know, send, send an email, thanking them for the time, what you learned, what, you know, what you could take back. Um, and, you know, hopefully this is something that they foresee themselves doing in the future. Um, again, it doesn't have to be a two page email, but just, you know, a, a couple lines and, and make it sincere and, and, you know, sign your name. Um, you know, if you have any additional questions, you can ask in there, but if you don't 
send a thank you. I just, you know, I, I'm kind of old school. I think it's, it's nice. You know, I teach my kids, you get a gift, you write a thank you card or you, or you call somebody and you say, thank you. Um, I just, for me, that goes a long way. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, I agree, Kathy. Mark, what is your, uh, your uh, opinion? Yeah, that? yeah, I think a thank you note and make it personal. Yeah, yeah maybe bring a sheet of paper, a little book. And if I, if I mention the New York Jets, say, I hope, to, <laughs> I hope the Jets win at least one game this year or something like that. And, it, and then that it keeps that connection. And I'll remember, oh, that was uh, Michael, the, uh, the Jeff fan. Mm -hmm. That goes a lot of, that goes a long way. Um, you know, it, it doesn't have to do with pharmacy, no, but. It's about interpersonal relationships. So you know, Mark, it's funny you said that because I was in sales for about ten years in my career path, and I, you know, years ago everybody had business cards everywhere you went. You left a business. I know. Card. So whenever I would get a business card from one of my accounts, I would write a personal thing about that person on the back of the business card, and before I would go in to see them, you know, the next time I had a, a visit, I would kind of refer to that, so I would have that that kind of secret handshake with the person. Yeah, and exactly. it does really go a very long way. Does. And that's okay. how you form your relationships and your networks and things like that. That little personal, you know, something about a person that you know makes them feel special. Yep. So I think that's very important. So. Well, and last thing, if you, we may have in-person visits. I, I don't know yet about in-person interviews, but if you do, show up on time. Show up 10 minutes yes. early. Show up 20 mm -hmm. minutes early. Yes. Showing up late really annoys me. Yes, <laughs> I agree. Or if you're going to be late, text, call. I'm in stuck on the D train. Okay, I get it. Mm -hmm. I, I we all, We've all gone through that. And shine your shoes. Yes, dress and professionally. Also, guys, yes. Yes. don't put the tie down to here. <laughs> Tie it up, okay? And look great, at great people points. when you're interviewing. Yes, great points. Yeah. Professional okay. dress, ladies, nothing low cut, nothing too short, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and again, focus on who you're talking to. And again, look them in the eye and definitely, right. I'm with you. Do not be late. That, that makes me so oh. mad. <laughs> oh, it drives me nuts. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we're nearing almost eight o'clock. So on behalf of all of our students that took the time to come to this very informative residency session, I just want to thank you on behalf of the, the students and our program. Um, this has really been a, a great hour. I hope the students are taking away lots of information to kind of, you know, hit a home run when they're on the other side of the Zoom lens doing their uh, residency interviews. So Kathy and Mark, again, thank you for your time and your insights, very much appreciated. And I'm sure I'm getting all these thank yous now in the chat box. So all of our students are saying, thank you so much, great session. So I know it was very well received. So thank, thank you, you it was, again. It was fun, it was fun. Oh, thanks thank for inviting you. me, it was fun. All right, yes. have a great, have a great evening. Back. Okay. Thank you, take care everybody. Go White Sox, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll see. All right, thank have you. a good evening. Yeah. Right. Bye-bye. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. It was great, it was fun, thank you. See you next year. Yes, yeah. yes, definitely. <laughs>